All right, everyone, welcome to our afternoon session for the Cyber Attack and Risk uh, Trusted Cloud Virtual Conference. And we will start our afternoon keynote speech. And our keynote speaker is uh, Kevin McGee, Chief Security Officer at Microsoft Canada. Uh, at Microsoft, uh, Kevin leads the technical teams uh, who are Microsoft uh, architects, uh, practitioners, and a store of uh, trust. And he is one of the Canada's leading authorities on cybersecurity and cyber risk governance, and often writes lectures and contributes to curriculum development for Canadian colleges and universities uh, on topics of cybersecurity governance and entrepreneurship. So he has a lot of insights, and we are very pleased to have Kevin join today's session. And Kevin's topic will be security in the age of advanced persistent transformation. All right, all yours, Kevin. Hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks uh, for having me today. And hey, thanks for everyone else uh, online who wanted to spend a little time with me today. Uh, you have a lot of choices of how to spend your time, and I really appreciate you investing in, in what I have to say. Um, welcome to my home. Um, you're, you're, I'm coming to you live uh, from my home office. Uh, so with that, you may hear dogs bark. You may hear lawnmowers mow. You may, uh, you may hear all the things that happen in a working household. So uh, please roll with it, and please give uh, the benefit of the doubt to all the other speakers today. Doing this is is really uh, interesting and difficult and uh, hey uh, great uh, great job Brian and your team for putting all this together and making it happen so just uh, again, again not so much about me but what I'm interested in I work with a lot of boards of directors I'm an ICDD uh, certified public director uh, I work with a lot of hospitals universities and uh, whatnot trying to solve some of the big challenges the big systemic challenges the big think first principle challenges of security to step back and rather than fighting you know Know, the, the immediate trends, think about the longer arc of problems and whatnot. And that's really what I want to share with you today. These are some of the organizations I work with, with startups in the cybersecurity space, with students in the cybersecurity space. I have an interesting collection of folks I speak to on a regular basis and a great perspective on what's happening out there. I really wanted to share with you that I hope you'll find informative today. Uh, full disclosure, I work for Microsoft, so from time to time I may discuss Microsoft stuff. Uh, this is not in any way meant to be a sales pitch. This is just because I know Microsoft technology probably better than any other. I'll use examples that are Microsoft related as well to throughout the presentation. But what I wanted to talk to you about was advanced persistent transformation. And I kind of coined this APT is the next APT, a little play on the, on the, um, the acronym joke, because really what I have seen of last year is just the speed and acceleration of digital transformation in itself is becoming one of the major threats and the thing we need to think about and we need to think differently about. And I wanted to share with you sort of six lessons that the last year or so has really taught me in this space and about the need to really see the rate and accelerated rate of transformation as a risk that we need to manage and we need to be thinking about. So dive right into it. Number one, what yeah, resilient means has really changed over the last number of centuries and it has happened very quickly. I want to give you a great example of a very resilient organization. This is St. Barnes Hospital. St. Barnes Hospital is located in London, UK, and it was founded in 1123. And if you think about that, this hospital has executed on its primary mission in the same physical location for almost 900 years. This is an astounding story of resilience. It survived having its income stripped in the 1500s and had to rethink its business model, uh, so to speak. It survived the Great Plague of London. Think about it, a hospital in the heart of London during the Great Plague before modern medicine, and it still executed on its mission and provided care to its, uh, its patients back hundreds of years ago. Right after the Great Plague was the Great Fire, and the organization withstood the physical uh, destruction of part of its uh, facility and rebuilt and reemerged uh, resilient. Two world wars, including direct hits on the facility, the organization never stopped throughout that time executing on its mission, which was delivering care for its patient. Then what happened? Well, some of you remember WannaCry came through the UK, and for the first time, an event happened that forced St. Bart's to shut its doors, to not be able to execute on its primary mission. 
So what changed? Well, a nation state, cyber criminals, whoever you want to attribute, succeeded in doing something that the Great Plague, uh, Great Fire could not do. It changed the nature of resilience and there was no going back. There was no persevering. So the idea of what makes resilience in an organization in IT is very different from what the business sees as resilience. Most of the business sees a resilient organization is a financially sound organization or physically able to um, uh, respond to uh, things. And that could be even things like pandemics. But the pandemic is a great example in case study of where we see these two overlap. And the resilient uh, organization of the future is not the resilient organization of the past. Very quickly, we all moved to work from home, from teaching from home, and it changed in a very short period of months the entire nature of what makes an organization resilient. You've probably seen this quote from our CEO saying that you know we, we really saw an accelerated digital transformation that would take in years happen in a matter of months, and this is continuing into the future as well. This rate will not subside. Microsoft responded very well, I think, uh, internally as a company, as a resilient company. And I want to share the lesson I really learned from our response. One, we treated uh, all threats to the organization as enterprise level threats. And whether they were pandemics, they were things like earthquake or cyber events, we looked at what made the organization resilient. We provided clear priorities to managers, frontline managers, not just tech managers, that preserving life was the number one uh, priority. Protecting your customers, then protecting the company is what mattered most. Frontline managers there were able to take immediate action, knowing the priorities of the organization. We also prepared with tabletop exercises, and we do this throughout the year. We train on how to respond to different types of threats, not just cyber threats, or coordinated cyber threats with physical threats and whatnot. And this makes all the difference because what we're doing is we're building muscle memory as an organization of how to respond. If we do this in silos where we just do cyber, or we just do uh, pandemic response or whatnot, we don't really see the overall effects of one of these um, uh, major events on, on the organization. So we're really moving from a reliability, you don't put two power supplies in, to thinking how things are going to recover quickly. Uh, also, from attacks to assume breach in IT, question the business though. Go back to the rest of the organization that you work for. Are they thinking about resilience the same way? And are they building plans? The old way of resilience or the new way in which IT is thinking about? One of my favorite ta tabletop exercises is to say, this is not a uh, necessarily a cyber attack, but what would happen if a solar flare took out the GPS and communication satellites of the world, or a portion of it? What would the effects be in your organization? When I talk to boards, when I talk to CEOs, when I talk to CFOs, they generally say there's no effect. Well, then we found out, you know, a lot of their equipment connects and updates and communicates to headquarters via satellite communication. Their, their fleet of equipment runs on GPS as well, too. What are those resilient threats and emerging risks, not simply um, that, that hacker in the black hoodie um, that, are, uh, that are coming after your organization and we need to start preparing for. Having these discussions really early can really change the business's mind. Um, a great threat though out there is still the cyber crime and we're seeing this ever, emerge and evolve and they are going through the same digital transformation in the cyber criminal industry that we are. In fact, you know, we look at if you are using legacy systems, you are actually competing against an entire industry with an entire uh, supply chain now. Attackers are no longer just sitting in their basement, uh, you know, attacking you from um, uh, directly. They're building ecosystems. Uh, we find that some of the most predominant um, cyber criminals are now getting out of the direct extortion business. They're building tools and they're selling it to others. They're building criminal networks and syndicates and they're building these ultimate supply chains. What that's doing is that's lowering the cost of entry and the barrier of entry for skills, but also building out uh, ecosystems of the specific expertise. If you look at the ransomware uh, evolution we see, it landed on your machine and executed it, charged a, a standard 250 bucks. 
then we added a sense of urgency. It was an escalating amount of um, money that had to be paid. And we had that uh, we saw them add the Bitcoin or cryptocurrency as a unique way to pay directly as well, rather than Visa card cash outs and whatnot. This led to additional innovations in terms of affiliate models, where we're seeing attackers building out uh, infrastructure, making it very easy for any cyber criminal to use a simple dashboard to implement attacks. We're even beginning to see evidence that a lot of these criminal organizations that have made significant money don't know what to do with the money they've made, so they're investing it, much like VCs. Getting your business uh, to understand that cybercrime is not about defending ourselves against RIAC or the latest flavor of the day. It is defending our organization against an entire industry. We need to therefore think differently because ultimately it's an arms race. And there is strength in numbers. We can use those same factors. We can use things like cloud enablement of our security so that we're focused on the most important aspects um, as a SOC analyst of threat hunting or whatnot, or building out policies and automating policies within our organization, not doing the manual patching. We can take advantage of other technologies like uh, our intelligence security graph where we have a massive amount of threat intel that can really start to pinpoint and get ahead of threats for your team as well. And I really encourage you if you're using threat intel in the SOC and you're using threat intel from the security perspective, are you using threat intel at the at the senior levels, the executive levels, and, and does your um, board just get a mean time to resolution for attacks or are you providing threat intel to your board about your industry and your specific organization? These are the things that are going to make the better decisions in the boardroom that are going to trickle down to you in the server room and allow you to do a much better job of protecting the organization. The other two areas I think are the future of our industry are AI. Um, so. How do we bring uh, you know AI to really level the playing field, to go through those alerts, to, to make us much more efficient, and then automation. These are the two things that are going to change the economics to make it much more less expensive to defend, much more expensive to attack, and ultimately, you know, restack the board uh, for our size as well. So lessons learned there are to engage really in a discussion, not about ransomware as a technical problem or at the myopic level of RIAC or whatnot, but how do we really get the business to understand the fundamental first principles of that market, that cyber criminal market and how it's developing and how we need to readjust our positioning as a company and build a whole enterprise approach to securing against ransomware. Which leads me to zero trust. So everyone really at the start of the pandemic may or not have been on a zero trust journey. You are now, whether you know it or not, because ultimately the pandemic sent everyone home and we had to start figuring out how we're going to connect differently. And maybe you could use that ancient IPsec um, VPN solution you had because only 10 or 15 people were using it. But when we started to jam 10,000 people through that IPsec uh, old legacy system, it broke. Or backhauling the firewalls to get visibilities. We are moving to a new, uh, a new epic. We are not going back. We are on a zero trust journey whether you know it or not. For those of you that may not be familiar with zero trust and I suspect most of this audience is, it's refocusing around um, uh, authentication and identity around the user and the asset and protecting that as opposed to a perimeter based approach. And ultimately that means just looking at verifying the identity of the individual, looking at the device, looking at the type of access they want and then executing the policy. So if I'm in a coffee shop on my corporate device, I might only have read access, but if I'm in the office on a corporate device, I might have write access to it. So varying the degree of access based on the situation can make a big difference in, in how that works. Again, Microsoft really started our approach to this early. We took the traditional corporate network and we moved all of our users' accesses and devices to a zero trust model very early. So every Microsoft user accessed the corporate network, that was our first stage, as if we were an outside uh, entity and we were run through a conditional access approach to access all our resources. That was step one and this is where most organizations are as well too. We then started to think about publishing all applications to the internet as a zero trust approach, uh, building out uh, VPN access and segmenting our network logically um, business critical segments, IoT and OT, and then low impact things that need to be uh, protected better. 
why we do this? Same reason we do uh, segmentation in physical networks. No lateral movement, but also we can then look at you know providing different levels of security because we only have limited resources and personnel for different types of areas and provide expertise. Someone with IoT, OT expertise probably isn't as great as protecting SAP as they are protecting SCADA systems. So again, segmenting those networks can really make an impact as well. This is the zero trust journey we're all on. Thinking through how to really do this from a user perspective and what are overall enterprise risk goals is really the key to success with zero trust in my mind. And then uh, everyone who's seen me present or ever had a conversation knows uh, with me, you'll never get uh, through 30 minutes of talking to me without a book recommendation or two. I think what we really need to do as an industry is not just build our technical skills, but really build an understanding of the first principles of our industry uh, trends and whatnot as well. And the best way to do that in my mind is read. You'll find your own way, but I'm a book guy. So uh, I can make some recommendations. Uh, these are some books that I have really learned about what's happening out there and really recommend. Uh, this is how they tell me the world ends. Great books about the arms uh, dealers, the people who are, are building zero days and selling them in the marketplace out there. Kingdom of Lies, vignettes of how people fell into uh, cybercrime and really understanding who they are. They actually sit in cubicles. <laughs> they have quotas and they have a number of calls they need to make and whatnot. Really understanding your adversary is key. Sam Worm, great opportunity to really explore the aspects of cyber warfare and what the repercussions are and how we as businesses are becoming sort of targets in this greater geopolitical war as well. Um, uh, Singer and Cole really take a different approach. They do what they call it FICINT. It's fictional intelligence, I think it stands for in their mind. But basically it's a novel that tells and teaches the principles. So the their latest one is Burn In. It's about um, robotics and AI and some of the, uh, the future of OT attacks. Uh, the city of uh, Washington gets held ransom basically uh, uh, by uh, the flood dams in the city and flooding the city kind of thing. So reading's a lot, uh, a great chance to really explore some of these topics and step back from the technology. Uh, greatest place I can recommend to go to is the Cybersecurity Canon Project started by Rick Howard. It's now managed by uh, the Ohio State University. Uh, if it shows up on this list and it's a winner, I, I highly recommend using it as well. But we also need to get better as an organization about developing a common language, a common uh, common uh, nomenclature to discuss things. What's a breach? What's an incident? Uh, we use these words often interchangeably. And things like the attack um, framework for my um, matrix for MITRE is a great way to really get on a common way of discussing things, a common way of thinking of things. We can then start to really fingerprint how attackers are attacking us. And what if in the future, Rather than doing a signature for RIAC, what if we could develop a fingerprint for a specific ATP? And as they change their tools, techniques, and procedures, their TTP, we could really figure that out in real time via threat intel and via AI and automation, so SOAR, we could then reconfigure the security posture of the organization in real time to react to the uh, the, the TTP change of the, th uh, the threat actor. Sort of like when the Romulans fire and uh, uh, Picard remodulated the shield for you Star Trek folks um, in real time to adjust to the threat. This is where I really think we're getting. Uh, next year, if I could recommend that gets me super excited is now we have a countermeasures version of the um, uh, the MITRE architecture called Defend and we're starting to think about how we understand uh, how the attacker is attacking us, what our countermeasures for and then how we merge the two. This is an emerging area. It's a great opportunity not only for you to learn but these are new frameworks. They're looking for people who can lean in and help define this. We're setting at a time where you can actually make a difference. You can help define how our organization thinks about attacks and will build things for the future. This is not just a learning opportunity. This is a great opportunity to create a legacy, to really build your expertise and to give back to the overall community as well. So find some of these uh, opportunities where you can really lean in and provide your expertise to building our industry um, and professionalizing our industry. That's one of my main lessons learned this year as well. It will pay you back in spades. Last uh, couple are going to be focused on the layer eight aspect of security uh, and I speak a lot about leadership and empathy in the users and I really believe empathy is going to be the key to securing users. When I see this um, comic put out on Twitter or whatnot, I always cringe because we're always blaming Dave in the corner that it's his fault and we make fun of Dave and whatnot. 
But if you think about it, this user, are we going to expect that this user can just get across and navigate that, that bridge safely with no issues? And if he falls in, are we going to blame him uh, because uh, he wasn't able to use the bridge properly, even though it wasn't properly built? No, we don't. In the physical world, we put up safety barriers. We take responsibility. In fact, you would never build a set of stairs like this and blame the user. We have uh, in our industry, uh, in the building industry, a set of codes to say this is how you properly build stairs this is how you need to build them and if you don't and someone falls it's not the fault of the user of the stairs because the stairs are in dis disrepair or not built correctly it's actually the fault of the people who built the stairs so we need to think differently about stop blaming the user and really just let them do their job and and use those stairs use our systems and think about how we can build better processes and whatnot to make a great user experience secure the best way i can think about it is uh, for improving user experience is, is to look at something like password list when i log in in the morning my camera looks at me and says yep that's kevin and I go throughout my day, I never have to enter a password, yet I securely log into all of my applications seamlessly. It's a great working experience because the organization has spent time really thinking about how I work and how I authenticate. In fact, to the point where if there's an opportunity to use a shadow IT uh, resource that may be better than something I have published internally, I'm probably just going to use the internal thing because it's too much of a hassle to set up that different application, use that application, remember the password to that application. I have a great user experience, therefore I am more likely to comply. Make my user experience a nightmare and I am going to go out of my way to be a pain. Uh, make me change my password every six weeks to 27 letters, two numbers, a character from the Lord of the Rings, and a weird symbol. Um, and having to change that constantly, I'm just going to use password one, password two, password three. I'm going to defeat it. Uh, lock down the availability of a solution to the point where I can't use it. I'm just going to export something to Excel and use it uh, outside of the uh, secure system. Making great experiences becomes a, a real powerful way uh, to build compliance and security because education is just not going to get the same effect. So what does that look like? Well, maybe it's a defining a password strategy, what we want to do in terms of two factors. Moving identity to the cloud really gives you an advantage to to build out an identity, a federated identity solution across multiple systems and simply enabling the MFA. These are great first moves that uh, can make all the difference. Using an off um, app on your phone or your watch or whatnot to do second factor authentication, make it easy. It's amazing how I see employees brag about how easy it is to, uh, to connect to their systems once these are implemented. And the great thing is not only do these make you more secure, it often saves a fortune for the organization in, in hard savings. And, and not just um, uh, deferred income that could have gone to pay ransoms or whatnot down the line, but just in password resets, in productivity, because the individuals in accounting don't have to enter or uh, 17 passwords or not. They just do their job separate from security. Um, which finally, uh, my final message is always about um, security culture and how we change that and tone from the top really is the main discussion. I spend a lot of times with boards and I spend a lot of times with senior level executives talking about security and they often ask me, you know, what should we be doing? Well, the email you sent out in October for Security Awareness Week is our month is awesome, but it's not enough. You need to be visible. You need to be participating in the uh, the tabletop exercise. You need to show that you're engaged and involved and you are making it a priority. If the business, not just security, isn't making it a priority, if the sales um, leaders aren't talking about uh, security as a priority, if marketing is not talking about security as a priority, then it will fall on deaf ears throughout the users. So really uh, enabling tone from the top. How do we do that? You build uh, user education awareness programs for security. You're getting maybe marginal effects of that, maybe great effects. But what if you built a security awareness program targeting specific executives and leaders in the board within your organization, and you really got them to rethink about resilience, about what security culture is, about enabling uh, great user experiences. So they funded projects and budgets and it trickled down. It is ultimately a cycle. Um, so how can you change and disrupt that pattern and get them on board to really uh, to really further your, your needs as a security organization? It can be a far greater investment than posting um, 
posters at the end of uh, the hallway or October uh, messages for security awareness. And ultimately, you know, when I talk about KPIs and I talk about measurements and a CEO asks me or a board chair asks me, how do I know if I have a great security culture? I say the real litmus test for me is when someone clicks on something and they do something wrong and they download some ransomware or whatnot, that first moment there's fear, there's uncertainty, there's doubt. What happens in the second moment? If they feel they can put up their hand and they are part of an organization that will help them, that there won't be retribution, there will be a real willingness to help solve the problem. Um, then you have a great security culture. If they feel they have to pay the ransom uh, to hide it, or they're going to try and you know hold off telling their boss or alerting IT because they're fear, uh, there's fear of getting fired or retribution or whatnot, or they're going to be shamed, uh, what um, then you've got a bad culture. Creating that human firewall where people feel empowered to be part of the solution and feel empowered to be able to make mistakes because they will make mistakes. We all do. Um, that's part of that new resilience model and building that culture can make all the difference. So bringing it all together, what do I feel a modern security organization really looks like and, and what are the two areas I think Microsoft is really focusing on helping our customers solve some of the big challenges. First, I think really it all starts at the board level and this executive level. If they do not start to see risk as enterprise level risk, that those linkages between the solar flare and the satellites in the business, um, how physical security and um, uh, logical security are now overlapping and whatnot. That's where the big policies are, are really coming from. Telling IT to protect the crown jewels is not going to work. Telling IT to that what the crown jewels are, what the most important business processes are, and having a discussion about how to protect those while making them available so you don't lock everything down so that people can't do their job and they, they create a um, shadow IT, that's really these discussions that need to be had. Far too often we're pushing information up. We're pushing data up to the board and they're interpreting it. We're not we're not really having these deep conversations. We have it in finance. We would never allow the person that receives the, um, the invoice to pay the invoice because there's the potential for fraud. Why do we have the person that patches the server be the one that reports that the server got patched? Some basic discussions around governance can really make a difference. That allows us to author um, enterprise security policies, which can then be examined by the architects of um, within IT, which then can then be operationalized as a means to secure the organization. And it's really a loop. Right? It really is a feedback loop. There's a separate organization we're starting to build, which is, okay, what happens when they're exception? This is the else uh, statement after all the ifs. Something goes wrong. We need to have an incident response team. We need to have a way of responding to those things. And the third stage is how do we uh, in integrate threat intel so that we're getting ahead, we're getting smarter, we're constantly understanding our security posture and bettering it. And ultimately, this becomes a circle. Policies are now rewritten based on what we learn. New architectures are built, implemented. We find it breaks. The incident response has to, uh, team has to go out and fix something. That further provides intelligence, which is fed back to the senior leaderships that informs the uh, policy changes and development. This can't be a build the policy once and forget it approach. And what that does is really maintain a constant posture management for your organization that is holistic across. And it falls into my mind in two categories. One is zero trust. How do we uh, prevent passively uh, via um, so controls and whatnot, some of those generally accepting accounting principle type solutions for IT, but then how do we modernize the SOC so that we can respond uh, to incidences, but more importantly, learn from them and feed back into the organization how we can better ourselves and improve. This is the, this is the future and this is, I think, ultimately how we change the game uh, for security. So with that, uh, my name is Kevin McGee. I'm the Chief Security Officer of Microsoft Canada. I uh, hope you've uh, enjoyed the discussion. Hope that there was something in there that was of value that you can take back to your organization and, and make your organization better, stronger, and more secure. I'd like to thank Brian and the conference uh, for having me today. And I will, if we have time, take some questions. Otherwise, I will be transitioning now to the Microsoft Virtual Booth, where I'll be available to take some questions, engage in some conversations, and learn as much from you, hopefully, as uh, uh, as I'm able to uh, to offer in advice and um, 
and details as well too. So with that, thank you, thank you, Brian, and thank you everyone for spending uh, half an hour of your day today with me. Have a great day and a great conference.